So there are, um, there are things, I think, that at times we reserve for special occasions. Uh, some of you in your house probably have dishes that you only use a couple of times a year. How many of you that's true? You got like, you got your daily stuff and then you got your special stuff and you use it a couple of times a year. Some of you, maybe you've got like a beverage, like you've got a bottle of wine or champagne that you've been holding on to for that special occasion, right? Um, some of us have clothes in our closets that only come out for special occasions, right? For me, that thing's called a suit, <laughs> and I don't wear it to church on Sunday, right? It's a special occasion that gets me in a suit, right? I feel this way about this study that we're beginning today. Um, the book of Acts, for me, is sort of uh, a special occasion sort of study in the book of the Bible. In the Bible. Um, I might even say this. Uh, I, I've been sort of saving this uh, for, for a while, saving it for a time like this in the life of our church. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but some of it we've grown just a little bit in the last couple of years, uh, those of you that have been around here for a while, you know that we, um, we are a little bit bigger than we used to be. And it's just sort of dawned on me recently that God's been sort of gathering people to this thing called Summit Church. And like week after week, we see more and more people show up. And, uh, and week after week, I just find myself being convinced that God's gathering us together for a reason that's bigger than just getting bigger. Amen? That it's not just about us getting together and looking around and saying, wow, what a great crowd, and isn't this fun that we're a part of something that's big and growing, but truly that God's gathering us to this place and gathering us as a community because he has something for us that is bigger than just being bigger, something that is beautiful and good. And I'm sensing that there's sort of a new season in the life of our church. And one, a season that I think particularly aligns with what we're going to be looking at in the book of Acts. I believe the book of Acts is particularly relevant for where I see us moving in the days ahead. The book of Acts, for those of you that don't know, it's this New Testament book that is powerful. It is monumental. It is about a group of people who lived the gospel out in such a powerful and dynamic way together that exploded from beyond their city to the region around them and from the region around them to the world. And truly, we trace our DNA, our origins, our history, to the group of people that we're going to be looking at in the course of this series. It was an incredibly special time. And I genuinely believe that this is a very special time in the life of our church. Um, so for me, I guess um, this is the way I've been thinking about this the past couple of months is we're breaking out the fine china and uh, we're gonna look at this beautiful thing called the book of Acts. Now, something I want you to understand as we dive into this, and I think it's really important to get this, to wrap your mind around this, to really grasp the meaning of what I'm about to say. It's important for us to understand that as the Gospels came to an end, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the biographies of Jesus, as those books came to an end, those books ended leaving us with a question. They close with a question mark. Um, the, the Gospels leave us with a place of sort of wondering what's next. And really the question was, now what? Now what? Now that this has all happened, now what? Um, we read about the life of Jesus in his biographies. We listen to the teachings of Jesus. We see this beautiful new way of living towards others and living with God. We come face to face with his death. We come face to face with, with, with his resurrection. And then in the conclusion of all that we see in the Gospels, we come to this place where we have to make a decision. Like the Gospels really just ask us to answer a question, that is, what do you say about Jesus? And when you see the Gospels and you come to that conclusion and you make a conclusion about Jesus, when you see that he is God revealed to humanity, when you see that he resolves the questions and wondering that we have about who God is and what his heart towards humanity is, when you come to the realization that Jesus is opening up this new way of living life with God, it leaves you in this place of saying, now what? On a practical level, we're left with this sort of question like, okay, well, so now what do we do? Okay, I get that Jesus is who he is and I'm really inspired by it. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. But now what? And I think it's a question that a lot of people ask. I think in our culture today, it, one of the struggles we have is that we give intellectual assent to this thing called faith in Jesus, and yet we don't really see it take traction in our lives. And we say, well, now what? What am I supposed to do now that I've drawn conclusions about who Jesus is? I think most of us in the room, the reason we gather here, the reason maybe you've been drawn to Summit, is we know we don't have time for empty religious practices. That is not what we're about. And yet at the same time, there is this beautiful life in God. There is this beautiful picture that's being painted by Jesus that we're compelled to. So we're saying, well, how do we do this? How do we live this out? Where do we go from here? What's next for me as an individual and for us as a group of people? What do we do to live out this life? So I say that to, to, to set this up. 
The book of Acts answers that question. It, it closes the gap between the question that is left after the resurrection of Jesus and how you and I live our lives on a daily basis. The, the book of Acts is this beautiful and wonderful account of the first church, its birth and its, its struggles and its expansion. And it's a, it's a letter, it's a book that doesn't just inspire us, but it instructs us. It shows us something beautiful and wonderful, and then it calls us into that beauty and calls us into that wonder to live this out. I think it's a really important point that needs to be made as we dive into this. Not only does it resolve the question we have about what's next, but it also invites us to participate into something. So we're going to study the book of Acts, but I truly believe it would be tragic if the fullness of Christian experience is that people that follow Jesus gather themselves in a room together, read stories of what God did in years gone by, and then reminisce together and call it all good. Right? I mean, I think we probably could agree. Would you agree with me? It would be fairly lame if Christianity was about you and I seeing like, man, God did some amazing stuff back then. That's really cool. And we left it at that, right? Like we just looked at the theory and never got into the practice. So I want to make it very clear that the reason for this is that we would begin to understand not just what God has done, but what God is doing. Let me explain it this way. Um, this class Christmas a couple of different friends, I don't know what, they, didn't, they don't even know each other, um, they bought me magazine subscriptions for Christmas, which that's like buying somebody a buffalo. That's like a rare thing these days, right? Like, <laughs> do magazines still exist? Yes, they do. I love magazines, which is, they didn't know that, um, but I love magazines. I still love like flipping through and reading. So they bought me some magazines and I got them and, and, uh, and it's kind of fun because every month I get a couple magazines in the mail. If you don't know this, um, because maybe you, you've grown up in a world that, without magazines, um, <laughs> Magazines are about specific topics, specific things, maybe hobbies, maybe practices, and then um, those, those magazines extrapolate different ways to do those topics. They talk about them. They even inspire people to participate in them. Uh, this last week, I was thinking about Acts, the book of Acts, and I happened to be reading one of my new magazines that I got, and as I was flipping through, I realized this. My friends chose these magazines for me because they knew these are activities that I'm interested in. These are things that I like to engage in. And I just imagine, what if I was a person who all I ever did was sit and read the magazine, but I never did the things that were in them? There'd be something flat about that, right? I would be missing the point of the authors. The individuals who have crafted these publications, delivered them into my mailbox, have intended that not only would I read about the adventures of others, but that I myself would engage and live the adventure as well, that I would experience those things as well, that I would be participating and learning. The same is true of the Bible. If you and I simply look at it and we admire it and stand off at a distance, we're missing out on the intention of its author. Are you with me? So we go into the book of Acts with this understanding, with this idea that we are learning, but while we're learning, we are also discovering how to live life in an entirely new way. The heart behind this series, our greatest desire, my desire, is that we would make a deep connection with what we see in the book of Acts and with the way that we're living our lives every single day, that this would be translated into our language, translated into our time, that we would participate in the very things of God that we see the earliest Christians participating in. These are our origins, and our origins speak to who we are to be today. So with that, Acts chapter one, if you have a Bible, you can open it up there. If you don't have a Bible, words are on the screen. We're going to begin by just reading chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to start walking through the opening of this letter because it tells a story about where this whole thing's going. So Acts chapter 1, verse 1 starts like this. It says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he'd given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he'd chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So real quick, just want you to recognize this thing opens up like a letter, right? So it opens up here, dear Theophilus. Theophilus is an individual that the author Luke is writing to. Luke is the individual who wrote the gospel of Luke, and so this is sort of a continuation. It's like a companion to the gospel of Luke. It's like um, a sequel, except that this sequel, unlike most sequels, is as good as the first one. Got me? So, so Luke is writing a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. This is like the Gospel of Luke Part 2. And he writes to this guy named Theophilus. Now, Theophilus, um, whether a, a 
physical person or whether this is a theoretical person, doesn't really matter. Theophilus literally means beloved by God. That's what that name means. Some scholars think that he was just sort of writing to the people of God. Other people think this was a letter written to somebody specific, a work that was written to a specific person. In either case, it doesn't really matter. It's just the story that, that Luke is continuing from the gospel of Luke. And this is why I wanna point this out, the connection between this. Notice that he says, as he summarizes the Gospel of Luke, he says that he's summarizing, he's dealing with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. There's a word for me that kind of pops off the page when I read that. It's all that Jesus began to do. Began. Like, when I see this word and I see the word, think about what it means, beginning means this was just the start, right? Right? All that Jesus began to do is what the Gospels are comprised of. That should be stopping us in our tracks for just a moment and thinking a little differently because for most of us, when we read the Gospels, we see that as the beginning and the end. That's the culmination of all that Jesus did. And when Luke himself is writing, he says, oh no, the Gospels of Jesus, even past the resurrection, that's just the beginning. This is mind-blowing when you think about what this means. Luke is saying that we read in the Gospels the beginning of the work of Jesus. So oftentimes, we find ourselves sort of gazing into the empty tomb, and I think that really des describes how most Christians lived our lives. We kind of gaze off into a future, not understanding necessarily what's going to happen next. We sort of sit passively looking at this thing that's occurred, and yet Luke says, this isn't just about what happened in the past. That's the beginning. There's something happening in the present, this is what Jesus began to do, which tells us that what we're about to read is what Jesus continues to do. So this is the continued work of Jesus. This is the continued activity of Jesus among humanity. So Luke says this. He goes, okay, so that was just the beginning. Now you're going to get to the real stuff. I'm going to tell you what God's really been up to. And he says, I, I, this all happened. All these things I've summarized, it happened after the resurrection for 40 days. And he says during that 40 days that Jesus was teaching them about the kingdom of God. And I just really quickly want to mention this because it's going to come up throughout the book of Acts. The kingdom of God is sort of a summary statement that, that, that Luke uses in his writing to encapsulate all of the teachings of Jesus, all of the ways of Jesus, this sort of upside down understanding of how we live our lives. When he talks about the kingdom of God, he's saying this is what Jesus was teaching. Jesus was teaching his ways, his, the, the way that we relate to God, the way we relate to others. He was unpacking those things and showing them how to live this life. So Jesus is teaching them how to live in this new sort of life, and then it continues in verse 4. It says, while staying with them, speaking of Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. And this is something we're going to unpack. It's incredibly significant. We'll see it next week. And then in verse 5, he says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So you have to understand this baptism phrase. You'll be baptized with the Spirit. And he references, he says, in the same way that John baptized with water, you're going to be baptized with the Spirit. You kind of wonder, what's this all about? Well, during the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, there's this individual named John the Baptist, where we get this whole word Baptist from, right? This whole idea kind of continues on. John the Baptist was baptizing people who were making a further commitment to pursuing God in a sincere way. But baptism was a practice of the Jews that went far back into the history of Judaism. Anytime there was a person living in various nations around Israel and they were compelled by or drawn into this life of God that the Israelites were modeling for them, they would come to the people of Israel and they would say, I want to be a part of this, and they would be baptized. And when they were immersed in the water and they would come out, in fact, it's this beautiful foreshadowing to the death and resurrection of Jesus, but when they would be washed in this way, it was like this physical, public, symbolic statement saying, all of my life is going to be different now moving forward. The core of who I am, how I identify myself as a person, where I find my meaning and my purpose, all of that is now different because of this baptism. It's this symbolic statement of a life that is radically and fundamentally changed. Jesus says to these disciples, he goes, listen, the same way that people have been being baptized in that way, I'm going to baptize you with my spirit. I'm going to immerse you in my spirit. I am going to give you my spirit in a way that is so powerful and so dynamic that in every dimension of your life, you will be different. It will redefine your existence. It will be an entirely new way of living. 
Humanity is really only known one way, and Jesus says there's going to be a new way for you to live your life. So he says this to his disciples, and of course, brings up all sorts of questions, right? Somebody looks at you and says, I'm going to do something to you, and it's going to change everything. Good or bad, you have questions, right? So he says this to the disciples, and undoubtedly, they're questioning in their minds the implications of this. For them, the implications probably had to do with some sort of rebellion or overthrow of the Roman government. The Romans are an occupying nation, and the people of Israel, even the disciples of Jesus, had this nationalistic obsession. And so for them, there are these questions of, maybe when we have power, we'll have the power to overthrow this government, and we can be the new people reigning, and God will reestablish Israel as the nation that it's supposed to be. There questions with nationalistic implications in their minds. And so they asked in verse 6 when they hear this, so they asked Jesus, by the way, it says, so when they had come together, they asked him, I want you to recognize that this is after the resurrection, and there's something about the casual nature of how Luke mentions this. I know that uh, lots of people hypothesize about the re- resurrection of Jesus. They theorize about it. There, there's something about the casual nature of this, as if Jesus is like at the barbecue, like he came over And while they're standing around, it's like, hey, Jesus, by the way, you said something yesterday. I mean, do you realize there's a very casual nature to this interaction with Jesus that that sort of indicates the reality of his presence with them in this moment? And so those of you that maybe struggle with Christianity, I think these are sometimes encouraging things to realize people don't fabricate casualness in this sort of way around things that are this significant. So anyways, they're hanging around the barbecue grill, and they look at him, and they say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Totally nationalistic, right? Like, Jesus, you've resurrected, now you're giving us power. Please tell me, we're going to set up a nation like the nation that we want. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, he says, listen, that kind of stuff's not yours to worry about. In fact, this is what he's really saying. That kind of thing is not the kind of thing that I want my people thinking about. Nationalism is not the business of people who follow me. Are you clear on this? nationalistic interests are not the things that my people are passionate about. Jesus switches the subject. They've got questions about the nation, and Jesus says, no, 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 listen. He continues. And by the way, what he's about to say defines the entire book of Acts. Chapter 1 to chapter 28 is defined by verse 8 of Acts chapter 1. He says this, don't worry about that other stuff, but you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the promise of Jesus. This changes everything. This promise that Jesus makes to these individuals completely redefines the trajectory of human history. This moment I want you to understand what he says here. He looks at the disciples and he says, I want you to wait, you're gonna receive my spirit. But then he says, you'll receive power from the Holy Spirit. This is an absolutely remarkable promise that he's making. You'll receive power. The word for power is this Greek word dynamis. Dynamis is the word that we use to get the word dynamite, obviously expressing some sort of power. It's also where we get the word dynamic right, that there's this life, there is texture, there is something going on, there is movement to things, there is a dynamic taking place, there is dynamite, there is power. He says, you will receive this dynamis, you'll receive this power, you'll receive my spirit, and my spirit will give you a power that is beyond anything that you have ever experienced in your life. I am going to allow you to experience things that you would never experience without me. What he's talking about is this, he's saying, you're going to You're going to experience things that are completely unexplainable in your own life. You're going to experience things. He's talking about things that are going to take place in you. He's talking about things that are going to take place around you. Talk about things that happen in your life. And apart from God, they are completely unexplainable. Let me just give you an example. A couple weeks ago, I was texting um, with my best friend that I had growing up. We don't text much these days, like maybe once or twice a year we kind of chat with each other. In this text message, he mentioned a friend of ours named Stacy Summers that was a friend of mine when we were in jun- like grade school and junior high. And uh, he mentioned his name, and man, I had, it was like a blast from the past. You ever have that where someone mentions their name, and like you just go right back to the time and the place, you're like, man, I haven't thought about that person for years. So I did what everybody does these days. 
I went on Facebook, right? Yeah, I was like, I wonder whatever happened to Stacy. And so I go on to Facebook and I look him up and I start stalking his profile. I get about midway down the first little part of the page there and I'm like, you know, I should at least give him the opportunity to do the same to me. That's cordial. So I sent a friend request. And, uh, and so I'm looking at his profile. By the way, that's fair play these days. That's, you, if you're going to stalk somebody, at least let them stalk you, all right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at his profile, and, uh, you know, it doesn't take really long looking at somebody's Facebook profile to figure out a few things. And so I was just looking at his profile, and I realized since our lives went separate directions back in junior high, uh, the trajectory of his life hasn't been a, an easy one. And I could just tell pretty quickly, it's been a rough road for him. And I remember just, I was just sitting and looking at my computer and I, my heart kind of broke. I was like, oh man, like he's had a rough go. And it was pretty obvious. And uh, I didn't think much about it. And then um, I got an email saying I had a message and it was a message from my friend Stacy. And so uh, I opened it up and he um, had looked at my profile page and stalked me. And he's like, hey man, you know the whole thing. And then it got to this one part where he's like, you're a pastor? <laughs> And like, I could just hear it, you know? He's like, do I need to go there and tell people the things you did in middle school? Like, is that something? Like, do people know who you really are? Like, do they understand? Like, you know, you could just hear the incredulous nature of his comment. It was like this realization. And as I, as I listened, as I saw that and thought about it, I thought, man, you know, that's just the response that most people have in my life today. Most people that knew me when I was young, most people knew me when I was in school, most people find out that I do what I do, stand in front of thousands of people and speak. Their, their minds are blown. Like, how in the world does this guy do this? Not only is he smart, like, he wasn't smart enough to put a sentence together, and he was incredibly fearful of getting in front of people. Like, how in the world am I doing what I'm doing? And I'll just tell you this. It's impossible without a power. I would not do this if it wasn't for the power of God inside of me. I'm just telling you this. Every week I get up here, every week I go down, and, and every week I just think, God, it is your power within me that makes this even possible. This is not what I predicted. Some of you, sometimes you say things to me like this. It's like you read my mail. Some of you feel this way. You're like, man, were you talking to me? I'm like, I swear, these lights are just bright enough. I can't make great eye contact. So no, I'm not just talking to you. But when you walk out of here on a Sunday and you say, man, I just feel like that was like aimed right at me. That's the power of God in your life. There, there have been times, even in recent years, very recent years, when I have gathered with others and I've laid hands on and prayed for people who were in helpless and hopeless situations physically, spiritual, and we have seen those situations turned around in ways that I cannot explain apart from the power of God. There are stories of people, some of you are, are some of these stories, where we look at our lives and you go, the trajectory of my life, the turn that my life took is unexplainable apart from the power of God. That's what Jesus is describing Jesus is describing something that I have seen, something that you've seen, but so often forget that he gives us a power, power to live a dynamic, power to live a, a dynamic sort of life, a, a powerful sort of life, power to be people that we never thought we would be, and, and power to do things that we never thought we would do, power to change things that we never thought we could possibly change or influence. He does that in us. He promised us power, but I want you to get this clear. It is power for a very specific purpose. And I, I say this because I think there's some frustration. I think even now, some of you are saying, well, man, yes, I get it. Like, Jesus has given power, but you have this frustration with Jesus because he didn't give you the power that you wanted at the time you wanted for the thing that you wanted. But Jesus gives us this power, and he makes it very clear in this statement, Acts 1.8, that the power that he gives us is for a reason. I just want you to listen to this. This is specific. This is what that power applies to. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my what? witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So the purpose of the power, the focus of this power is that you and I would be witnesses. Witnesses. A few years ago, there's this basketball player that sort of rose out of the mundane NBA. A guy named LeBron James. And suddenly we were watching a player like we hadn't seen in a long time. Like, I don't know about you, but those of you that are basketball fans, it was like we were longing for another Michael Jordan, and we got one, right? LeBron James. We're watching a guy play basketball these days who seems to play the game in a way that people have never played it before. There's a command that he has over the game. There's a presence that he has 
in the game. There's an ability that he has to take over, unless it's against Steph Curry during game one. But he has this ability, right? (laughs) So his sponsors, one of his major sponsors, Nike, a couple of years ago, recognized that while we are watching LeBron James play the game, we are watching something special. And they came up with this advertising campaign to talk about it. And there was one word associated with the campaign, and it's the word witness. And they said, we are all witnesses. Suddenly it was on t-shirts and it was on TV screens and magazines if people get them. Witness, this word witness. Witness. And it's this idea that while we sit on the sidelines, we are witnessing greatness. We are seeing the game played in a way that the game has never been played. We are seeing a power and a control, something that is dynamic, and we're seeing this and we're telling the stories. When you gather around the water cooler with friends at a barbecue, we're talking about plays that he played, specific things, and they stand out in our minds because they're that amazing. That is what it means to be a witness. It means to see something that is great. When Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, you are going to have power and you are going to be my witnesses, it is because we are going to stand and see things that are great. We're going to see a command. We're going to see a power. We are going to see things that are unexplainable outside of this greatness of what he has given us. That is what Jesus is describing. We are witnesses. But I want you to catch this. It is not simply witnesses of the past. It isn't like he's looking at these guys and saying, hey, tell them all the things I began to do. Remember this? Go back to that. Luke was talking about all the things Jesus began to do, and that ended with the resurrection. Now he's looking forward, and he's saying, you will be continually ongoing my witnesses. So it isn't just the past. He's not just saying, we're going to rekindle some old flames of things that took place in history. He's talking about things that they would be witnessing every day. You will be my witnesses. It is the ongoing work of Jesus in and through his church. They will witness the ongoing greatness of God. They are going to be people and they are going to do things and they are going to change things that they never would have imagined and are impossible apart from the power of God. You, and he's saying this as much to us as he is them, you will witness greatness and you will tell stories of God's greatness. A few, few years ago, when um, Summit was about a tenth of the size that it is today, some of you remember this, um, we had an office in a house over on Glen Rose. Some of you, how many of you remember those days? Yeah, a few of you, awesome. And uh, some of you used to drive by and you're like, man, how does a church meet in that house? And uh, it was just our offices, just for those of you that want to know, just don't be confused. Um, but when I first came to Summit, I remember, I remember sitting in the office and there were, um, there were days when I just sort of wondered, like, what's it look like to lead a church in, in our community? Like, how do we do this? What's it look like? to lead us well. And, and there was this question that kept kind of arising, like what does it look like for us to be effective, to really do what God's called us to do as a church? What does it look like for Summit to be all that God intended it to be? And I remember just sitting there, and I've shared this with groups outside of here. Um, I don't know that I've ever shared this on a Sunday here, but I remember sitting there, and I recognized this. I, re- I remember thinking to myself, there has to be more to, to define our success, a win as a church, than nickels and noses. That our success as a church cannot be about butts and seats. Does that make sense? And this is what I remember thinking. I remember thinking to myself, if it's about nickels and noses or butts and seats, the NFL does the work of Jesus way better than the church of Jesus, right? Because they got way more money and they got way more people sitting in seats on a Sunday morning. And so I just realized, if that's the measurement for what it means to be the church of Jesus, then somehow we've missed the point, right? And so I found myself just asking, so what does it look like? How will we know as a church that we're doing what the church is supposed to do? And I remember just sitting there saying, God, whatever the answer to that question is, it must be something that is true whether one more person ever comes to this church or not or whether or not one more dollar ever gets put in the offering or not. It has to be true without money and without growth. That's what defines your kingdom. So I remember just sitting there kind of wrestling with that, questioning, and then suddenly there's just like this still voice of God saying, stories of people's lives being changed. Stories of people's lives being impacted by the gospel of Jesus, that is what will define whether or not we are doing what the church is supposed to be doing. And so from those early days on, we have made that the central measurement for everything we do. When we gather on a Sunday, when men gather in groups, when women gather on a Wednesday, when youth gather, when kids gather, when we go to camps, the question we're always asking is like, tell me a story of lives being changed. 
Every week when I gather with our staff, the first thing that we talk about is stories of people's lives being changed. And guess what? Every single week, there's somebody with a story of another person who the trajectory of their life is radically different because the gospel of Jesus has impacted them through Summit Church. And every time I just find myself saying, that is what this is all about. We'll have power and we'll be witnesses. We'll tell stories of people who've been healed and their stories have changed and their lives are together. We'll have neighbors that we've invited to church and they never came and suddenly they're just like loving their kids and getting involved. We'll see people that we had given up hope on suddenly having hope. That's what we see. We will witness the power of God. Jesus says in in Acts 1.8, and he says, I don't just want this here, I want this everywhere. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. When Jesus says that, there is not just a space component, but there's also a time component. This is the ongoing work of Jesus, that all people everywhere would experience this. So just catch the scene. The disciples say, Jesus, are you going to set up your new nation? And then he just drops Acts 1.8 on them. I've got a feeling at that point they were like, yeah, let's, don't, you guys don't bring up the political stuff again, right? <laughs> it's interesting that right after this is when Jesus departs from them. Verse 9 says, When he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So what did they do? Jesus ascends. They're watching the ascension. He's just said, this is what your life is all about. I want you to catch what they did. Verse 12, it says, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. By the way, Jerusalem was not their home. Jerusalem was where Jesus told them to hang out, and we'll see why next week. They go to Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away, and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying and then Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women who had supported Jesus' ministry and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. They gather in this place and they're praying together. They go to Jerusalem because he said to. And there is this sense in Acts chapter one that there is an expectancy that when Jesus promises that his spirit is going to be poured out on human beings and that they will have power, there is an expectancy on their part that Jesus will follow through with that and that their lives will be characterized by that. And so they've gathered in this place and they've recognized the resurrection was just the beginning. This thing's about to get going. In fact, in the next few verses, they appoint Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot. I truly believe the reason they do that is simply because they were like, man, we got work to do. We better get the team back together, right? We better get things in order because Jesus is about to do something. And all of this just speaks to this blaring, obvious point that on Easter Sunday, the story didn't end with Jesus' resurrection and a quick announcement that people get to go to heaven when they die. Like, this, the Gospels are not about you and I having some sort of deathbed confessional that we can give so that we can guarantee our heavenly salvation. There is a kingdom being established. There's a new way of life that is being lived. There is a third way to live, a new reality that is grounded in the death and the life of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit that he's given us a new reality that draws us in. And the story that begins here continues. When you look at the book of Acts, this is beautiful. When you look at this, these fumbling disciples, they become these empowered apostles. They're filled with the Spirit of God. They, they're called beyond their borders, and they make this radical difference. In fact, we read that the number of believers from this point forward, and we'll see this in the weeks to come, it goes from these 11 to around 30, 120, and then over 3,000 people just overnight, just overnight. It's just the thing's exploding. And by the way, it's exploding with people who swung hammers for a living and people that ran shops and businesses and people that taught out of books and people that studied books. It exploded among people who, who had kids to manage and relatives to deal with and, and bills to pay. Like, it exploded among regular people living regular lives. And we follow their journeys and we, we see where they go and it is beautiful and you realize the story has not ended. All of us, we trace our DNA in this room to this moment, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We are here because of that moment. We are connected. This is our origin. 
And it doesn't just define who they were, but it defines who we are. This is our story. This is our family tree. Can we share in the expectancy? Can we share in the expectancy? Can we live in the beauty? Can we lean into the life of God and ask for more than just our humdrum daily lives? Can we get past the beginning of what Jesus did and start living what he's continuing to do? That's the question that Acts presents us. All of this is available to us. There is a power that is greater than what you know on your own. There is a witness to something that is greater than what you'll ever see yourself do. There are lives that are extended in meaning beyond any meaning you could ever derive on your own. Just, just, just for a moment, I just want you to imagine that Jesus speaks these words to you. That he looks at you. And you got all sorts of now what questions, which by the way, we all do, right? All of us have, what am I going to do with my life sort of questions. I, I got a daughter somewhere that's graduating and I'm asking now what questions. My life's changing. Things are shifting. You've gone through those things where suddenly life is taking a turn and you wonder, now what? What's this season about? What should I do? What if in that moment when you ask now what about your life, instead of looking to culture, instead of looking to your education, instead of looking to people with expectations on you, what if when you ask now what, you look to Jesus and he just says, listen, I'm giving you my power and I want you to be witnesses of what I continue to do in people's lives. What would it look like? What would it be like? Would you stand with me? Can we pray together? Jesus, give us courage. Give us courage to authentically answer this question. Lord, give us a desire, even a burning in our hearts to live for more and to want more. I pray that you would reveal to us that the unsettledness of our souls, the disenfranchisement that we have with our government and our, our culture and people around us, the, the feelings that we have, all of those things are really just symptoms of our lives not being lived in, in your power and in your purposes. Lord, give us the boldness and the faith to lean in to the life that you have for us, that we would experience your power in this time. We love you. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we close by singing together? Let's just sing a chorus that we sang earlier, just for a moment. May you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And may you be witnesses of God's greatness in Spokane and Washington and the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here today. Next week, Acts chapter 2. There's some crazy stuff that goes on. We'll talk about it. See you next Sunday.